everyone, welcome to Two Car Pros. My name is Ryan and today I'm going to show you how to pull an engine out of an older vehicle. You could use this video to do a tutorial on a newer vehicle as well, um, but they're going to be slightly different. They're going to have different kinds of connectors. There's going to be a lot more electronics and things you're going to want to save. I didn't save very much on this. It's off an 81 Bronco and we're going to have to rewire the entire car anyway. And we're certainly not going to be using a lot of the uh, vacuum powered accessories. We're going to be replacing those with electronics. and on an old truck like this anyway, you should replace everything that's rubber while you're at it and you should probably replace all the electrics while you're at it as well. So I'm always an advocate of uh, just clipping it off and replacing it just because uh, the amount of headache trying to troubleshoot 40 year old wiring is, is just never fun. It is always much better to just rewire the car. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but it really isn't and it's going to reward you in the future. This car in particular actually has a little bit of history with me. Uh, it's my best friend's mom's first car. She's had it since she was 18, you know, uh, way back in the 80s. I think she bought it brand new or very slightly used and uh, then it developed some sort of problem and it just sat in her driveway forever and ever and ever. My buddy uh, finally wore her down enough and she relented and uh, gave the Bronco to him, which is super awesome. And what's kind of funny is this is actually the very first engine I ever worked on way back when I was like 16, 15 or 16, taking auto shop in high school. Uh, this is the first engine we sort of worked on and I'm using air quotes there because that is a very strong uh, term from what we did to this thing. So it feels good to finally uh, get this thing out, get it on a stand and we can rebuild it. So it is pretty cool that, you know, cars can stay in families for uh, generations and then come to a point where we can rebuild them and make them totally awesome. So with this tutorial, I'm gonna go ahead and assume a couple of things that you're decently mechanically inclined, you know what a wrench is, for instance, and you're going to be familiar with automobiles if you're going to be attempting this. This is about as difficult as it gets in the automotive world as an engine swap. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started removing our engine. Okay, step one when you are removing an engine is to remove the hood. This particular truck showed up without a hood, so I don't have to worry about that. When you're removing the hood, make sure you have somebody else to help you. Uh, removing the hood by yourself is often dangerous and you can end up damaging the hood, which you don't want. The second step is to assess. You need to look around and see what's actually still connected and well, what isn't. Here's a great example. This truck got to me and the AC compressor is no longer connected, which is actually a good thing, which means it's not under pressure and I don't have to worry about it. If your car or truck has an AC compressor that's still connected, you need to make sure that all the pressure inside those lines is gone. So you can hook like a vacuum pump up to it or you could, I'm not telling you to do this, it's just something you could do, is loosen one of these fittings and let the pressure come out very, very slowly, but that is uh, against EPA laws, so maybe don't do that. Alternatively, you could have a vacuum system put up into this and have the refrigerant uh, evacuated correctly, but luckily for me, someone at some point took this off, so I don't have to worry about that. The next thing you need to worry about is your exhaust. How is it hooked up? On these older cars, uh, especially these trucks, uh, they just have manifolds that go into a single collector way down there and usually it is just two bolts and you can remove that fairly easily. You need to think about how the throttle linkage is connected. That needs to be disconnected. Actually, I'm probably going to remove the carburetor before we even uh, remove the engine because because we're going to use the intake manifold bolts um, to pull the engine because they're pretty good size. We're going to use four of them. Um, alternatively, you could take the front accessories off while the engine is still in the truck. We may do that uh, to get clearance from our radiator here. And I always remove radiators when I am uh, removing an engine just because you don't want to plow the engine into the back of the radiator and then it's ruined. I don't know if we're gonna be reusing this or not. And it's just a good practice to be in. Um, you're also probably gonna wanna remove uh, the fan if it has one kind of no matter what, disconnect all of the lines and all of the electrics as well. Um, the vacuum line, the only one you really need to take off is the one going to the brake booster. Uh, and if there's any kind of, you know, HVAC control vacuum, which is what this is right here, and that goes into the back of the intake manifold. Now, 
there's two ways to undo all this stuff, right? There is a way to just do it quick and dirty, grab a pair of uh, side cutters or something, and you literally just go around clipping everything off. And you only do that if you're not going to reuse anything. If it's a total teardown, it's a total rebuild, you're redoing the wiring in the car, or maybe you're not even gonna use the car anymore. Maybe the car is inconsequential, which is fine. You just want the block. You can do that, you can just cut everything off and uh, get to pulling. You know, things like this that are kind of tough to find, little electrical connectors, I don't know if you're gonna be able to reuse or not. I would hold on to those. Um, but rubber lines like the heater core line, like right here, I would replace that. Those heater core lines are stock and this is from the 80s, so it's got some decades on it and you don't want to put the engine back in and then have things leak because you reused old rubber. So the first thing I always like to do is remove the battery. That way it can't ground out, short, battery explode, catch fire, anything nasty like that. Now, don't remove the battery yet if you're gonna use the starter to turn over the engine when we're removing the torque converter bolts, but I'm gonna turn the engine over by hand, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove the battery now. And mine is a half inch wrench. Take the negative off first. And then the positive, like that. And I like to just get the battery out of there so we can put it somewhere safe. The next thing we wanna do is remove our spark plugs so it makes turning the engine over really easy. So pretty easy, just remove the boot. Grab a 5.8 spark plug socket. Make sure it is fully seated on the spark plug nut. Remove it just like this. Very good. And we can go ahead and do that for all eight plugs, or however many plugs your engine has. The next thing I'm gonna focus on removing is the radiator fan with our spark plugs out. Um, we're gonna to wanna to turn the engine over, and to do that, make that a little bit easier on us, we need to take off all our accessory grab belts. And to do that, we're gonna take this fan off. You don't technically need to, but it's gonna make our lives a little bit easier. Not to mention, it's gonna make uh, the clearance of getting the engine out a whole heck of a lot easier, because this is easily six inches long or so. And these are just held on with 7 16 bolts. Um, they could be completely different on your application. Your application might not even have a radiator fan, but typically they're held on with four bolts. This one's not even, yeah, this one's not even correct. All the other fan bolts look like this on the bottom. This one on the top, I just removed the last one holding it in. So this fan has been off at some point because these bolts don't match. So should come off nice and easy. Once those bolts are removed, you just move it forward and pull it out of the way. So our old school AC compressor is right here on the top of the engine. And the reason I'm showing it without the belt because it got here without the belt is I want to show you how it's really easy to tell how to get a uh, V-band style belt off. That's what these are. The more modern ones that are wider with multiple grooves in them are called serpentine. Uh, this is called V-band, it's old school. And the way you can tell how to get it off is because you'll see a sweep like this. So the pulley can move in a sweeping motion like this. Automakers nowadays just use one of these, but back in the old school, uh, they used multiple V-band belts and then multiple uh, idler tensioners, which is what this is. So always look for this sweep, and sometimes, like on this one, the bolt for it is actually on the back side. So you might have to keep an eye out for that. So always look for the sweep, and then you'll find the bolt that secures it, and then that'll relieve tension, and you will be able to remove the belt. So I'm underneath the vehicle now uh, to demonstrate my point. See our sweep? Yep, so that is where we need to loosen the bolt. It's a 9 16 on this particular application. And remember, the bolt is on backwards to us, so it kind of feels like you're tightening it. So now with that bolt nice and loose, we should be able to swing the alternator up. Just like that, and remove our V-belt. And there we go. At this point, you can actually remove the alternator if you want, but I think I'm gonna leave it attached and just remove it when we put it on the engine stand. So here is our power steering pump sweep. So we gotta loosen that bolt. So we're gonna grab our 916 socket, slink it up in there, and loosen this bolt. There 
There we go. This bolt is nice and loose. It's actually just falling off at this point. I'm just gonna remove it. There's another bolt just above the adjuster, and if this one's on like crazy tight, um, you won't be able to twist the mount. It's a different size. This top bolt is interestingly 5 8 and not 9 16 See, as I loosen that, now our power steering pump will be able to swing down just like that, and we can remove our final V belt. There we go, remove that, and just throw these right in the trash and buy new ones because. Chances are they are multiple decades old. So the next thing I wanna go over is something I'm gonna say a bunch of times in this tutorial, uh, including rebuilding the engine, and that is turning the engine over. So way down in there, uh, the harmonic damper is bolted to the end of the crank snout. So how do you use that to your advantage? Well, you can put a 24 millimeter uh, socket on the end of a breaker bar, and you can use that to turn the engine over, and that's absolutely essential for taking the torque converter nuts or bolts off. So we can just put a breaker bar on there, we need something with a lot of torque, and we are able to turn the engine over by hand, just like that. See, so that's why we removed the spark plug, so it'll turn over nice and easy. So, as I mentioned before, uh, alternatively, you could be really fancy and activate the starter and make the starter do the work, but honestly, this isn't a ton of work, and I'd rather have the precision of a hand tool over an electronic motor. So the next thing I'm going to worry about is taking the exhaust off, and the reason I'm doing that is twofold. See this crossover pipe? It actually blocks our ability to get the torque converter nuts off, and once I unbolt it from the manifold way up there, it's going to be make taking the engine out a cinch. So it's always good. I like. I prefer to do it here because there's only two bolts, uh, two nuts, holding the Y pipe onto the manifold. Some people like to take the manifolds off and leave them in the cars. Uh, I don't like doing that. I like just unbolting it here because it's less work. So what we can do two is on these manifold studs, hose them down with some WD-40 or PB Blaster, whatever your favorite penetrating fluid is. And we're just gonna let those soak for a few minutes. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is grab a 5/8 socket on a swivel so I can get up on there, nice deep well, and then we're just going to remove it. You could use a breaker bar, you could use a ratchet, or an impact gun like I have. There we go, and we can slink our ranger up there and get the top guy. Just like that. So that same arrangement I showed you is on the passenger side as well as where the Y pipe connects. Uh, to go to the back of the exhaust on the car. I've already removed that, so we just need to undo the passenger side. Now, it's important to maybe have a jack stand or somebody hold this while it comes down, because you don't want it falling on you. With all our fasteners removed, now jiggle the exhaust out and down. So now we can worry about our torque converter nuts. There we go, Ford uses nuts, GM and Mopar typically use bolts. And uh, there's three of them, you gotta remove those. But before we do, these have never been undone in the entire life of the vehicle. So go ahead and hose them down with a little WD-40 and let them sit for a bit before you try to remove them. So while you have somebody hold the front of the engine with that breaker bar I sh showed you earlier, grab a 916 socket and we can remove these nuts while our flex plate stays in place because if you don't have somebody holding the engine the flex plate and the whole engine is going to just rotate over and you're not going to be able to get any torque on these and it'll just spin and there we go that's what one of the nuts looks like what we can do is spin the engine over I like to rotate always clockwise if you're looking straight at it because that's the normal rotation of the engine until we come across the next one. There she is. And just repeat the process two more times. So I was wrong, there's actually four nuts that hold this on. On GM stuff it's just three. I'm pretty sure Mopar as well. The Ford uses four of these nuts. So now the torque converter isn't technically connected to the flex plate. I mean, it's the studs are still in the hole so it would still turn. But we don't have to worry about forgetting about those when we are trying to remove the engine from the transmission. And that's something some people forget, so I like to get it out of the way. Uh, usually one of the first things I do. So next I'm going to draw your attention to the front of the engine, the front driver's side to be specific. And what you're looking at is the fuel pump. And I can see why this truck was sitting for so long. It looks like this fuel pump stopped working 
So they just kind of pinched it off and then uh, ran an electronic fuel pump up top. That's not entirely uncommon on old stuff, but the rear line, the feed line to the pump right here is still connected, so we need to disconnect that. And you can either do that properly or do what I'm gonna do, which is just cut it off. And if you're working on something fuel injected, typically the fuel pump is going to be in the tank. If you're unsure where your fuel pump is, just follow your fuel lines all the way from the tank to the engine and see where they go. There you go, I always use that. A little bit of gas leaked out, but not much. And uh, it's disconnected, good enough for me. So on this Ford, and I'm pretty sure uh, most other Fords, you have to take the starter out in order to get the engine out. And the reason that is, is because right here where it mounts to the transmission, it mounts through a block plate. And that block plate right here is in between the starter and flex plate. So uh, you can disconnect everything and the whole thing will still be held in by these two bolts. And it does have what looks like a ground going to it. I'm just gonna clip that off. There we go, I'm gonna replace all this wiring anyway. And then there's just two bolts, looks like, holding it in. So what I like to do on starters like this is you can see the accessible bolt down below and you can gauge how long of an extension you need based off of how long the travel is for the bottom bolt. It's gonna match the top. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out when you're removing that top bolt. All right, now I can grab our half inch socket and extension. There we go, there's one. And then here's our second one on the bottom. There we go, there's two. And we can just walk our starter towards the front of the vehicle. that and then we can remove it just like that perfect with the starter missing you can see the block plate I was talking about earlier so this is gonna come off with our engine and the starter actually bolts into the transmission so the starter has to come out so here's one of our engine isolators sometimes called a motor mount and uh, they are fixed to the car in a bunch of different ways this one looks like we'll just take a 19 millimeter socket <clears throat> and remove this nut just like that there we go and that should enable us to pick the engine straight up uh, upon removal and just do that for both sides so i'm back here by the transfer case at the rear of the transmission and you might be asking me what the heck am i doing all the way back here to take a transmission out well i'm going to show you because of the way Ford designed this, getting to it kind of where the transmission is, the bell housing bolts, is very difficult. So what I'm going to do is put a 5.8 swivel socket on the end of two very long extensions and then just feed it up there. Do not be afraid to use extensions to your benefit on bell housing bolts. See how nice that is? It fed all the way up there onto the bell housing bolt. Now all I have to do is supply power and that bell housing bolt should come off. Now when you're supplying power, make sure that the socket is fully seated against the bolt. And then, it should come out. There we go, long boys there. But, don't go any further. Just take out, I think there's five bell housing bolts. Uh, holding the transmission to the engine. This is actually fairly dangerous if you remove all of them and you're not prepared. So don't go any further than right here and leave uh, one or two of the bell housing bolts connected so that way the transmission doesn't just drop the second uh, the engine might shift forward a little bit. Or if you're working on a Mopar or GM, uh, it doesn't have those studs, it would just drop immediately. And you really don't want all that pressure on the torque converter uh, inside the transmission anyway. So uh, go ahead and leave one of these bolts in place, one or two of these bolts in place, until I tell you to take them out. Just loosen them so you know they're e you know you make sure that they're easy to get to and easy to take out. But leave them in place so that way the transmission isn't just hanging on the torque converter studs or on nothing at all. Okay, so on the bell housing bolt situation. Right up here, so right there, I have left one kind of loose that's gonna hold the front of our transmission. I have removed 
three of the five holding the transmission to the engine. The other one is right here. That bad boy. That is also going to help us hold that on. Uh, I like leaving it in two spots so that way it doesn't go uh, lopsided on me. And when I tell you, uh, you can remove those because if you take those out right now, all the weight is going to be on our torque converter or just flop on down. You don't want that either. So I'll tell you when to remove those two bolts, but all the other bell housing bolts have been removed using the exact same technique I showed you earlier. So pretty cool. This radiator that we're going to focus on removing next is uh, has a drain plug right here. I mean, just loosen so this particular radiator has a drain plug, but I've already tried removing it and it is all seized up. So we're going to have to go to plan B and just remove the lower radiator hose. So we can loosen the fastener that holds the hose clamp with an 8mm socket. Yours might be different. Just using a long extension so it doesn't obstruct your view. And we can move that hose clamp out of there. Just shimmy it back on the tube. There we go. So that did not go as planned off camera. I attempted to get this uh, hose off of the lower outlet for the radiator, but this rubber has been attached to here since, well, the truck was new back in 81, and it is completely vulcanized to it. So unfortunately, I had to do what you really don't wanna do because it makes an absolute mess is cut a hole in the lower radiator hose so it could get drained out. So now that all the fluid is drained out, we can proceed uh, to removing the upper radiator hose as well as the transmission cooler lines. Okay, so back top side, we can focus on getting the upper radiator hose off using our eight millimeter socket. Slide that hose clamp back. Hopefully this one is easier to get off than the bottom one because the bottom one had just vulcanized. The top ones are always easier because usually fluid doesn't sit in here and it's dry. So usually it's easier to get the top one off. Now we can get the transmission cooler lines off. So now we can remove our transmission cooler lines. Uh, there might be some ATF in these lines. So maybe you have a bucket ready or a terry towel. We're going to use a 17 millimeter flare nut wrench. Got to remember this. Just loosen those. You got to remember this truck was made. In the 1980s, back then, US makers were using a combination of metric and uh, SAE sizes, so you kind of just have to use trial and error to find them. There we go. And right on cue is some ATF. It's coming out of the cooler on the transmission, so uh, make sure you're prepared for that. So when you take that lower cooler line off. Just make sure you're ready with a bucket down below to catch any of the ATF that uh, might seep out of there. There's not a whole ton because it's not under pressure. The fluid's really not going to seep out. You can even just take a terry towel and kind of leave it propped there. That way it'll just kind of bleed in the towel and make less of a mess. So now we can uh, remove our radiator. So like I mentioned before, it's always a good idea to remove the radiator before you remove the engine, just so you don't accidentally blap into it. And it's also gonna give you some clearance, which you might need in this application. I personally don't think I would need that uh, to remove this 302 out of this Bronco, but I wanna cover everything. And if I was removing an engine and pretty much anything, I would definitely remove the radiator because it's in decent shape. We might have a record, we might reuse it, so maybe hold on to that as well. Uh, get it leak tested, pressure tested, and all that jazz if you don't want to spring for a better radiator. And it's usually just held in up top with these four 8mm bolts. It kind of has like a little hook system that clamps on like this, prevents it from moving anywhere, and then you can just uh, remove it just like this. So, remove those four bolts. stuff like this these little these weird little hook things and uh, you know little plates these can be tricky to find so you might want to hold on to stuff like this. some are special some are safe so you don't lose them with everything out of the way all the lines we can go ahead and just remove our radiator pulling it straight up see how much room 
we have now, we have way more room. The engine can come forward like 16 inches before it hits the AC condenser. For the record, you could take that out too. Now we can move on disconnecting everything. So the next thing I'm gonna worry about is disconnecting the AC compressor. Uh, it looks like somebody already took the line off of the slower connection here. So I don't worry about that or the system being charged. If you if you think the system might be charged or have any residual refrigerant, that's what this port is all about. You can connect a uh, AC evacuator pump to it and have that refrigerant safely and um, um, environmentally friendly evacuated and that uh, refrigerant will be processed and disposed of properly, which is always good. But we don't have to worry about that today. So. That's nice. Sometimes you get a win. This is one of those times for me, which I'm okay with. So any any way you can get these lines disconnected is uh, important for getting the entire engine out. Uh, unless you wanted to remove the AC compressor and set it aside and take the engine out, you can do that because these lines are, be are bendable, obviously. I've just bent this one aside. But I just like taking it all out at once, and it's pretty easy on this back fitting. I'm just gonna take an inch and 16 wrench and remove the fitting. These usually are, aren't on super, super tight. And I don't have a flare nut wrench big enough. I don't have an, an inch and a sixteenth flare nut wrench, so an open end it's fine. If it was really stuck on there, you could just cut the line off because you won't be able to reuse this. So I'm pretty sure this is the old style of AC, which they don't make anymore. They only really make um, R134A and the new 1234YF, I believe that's what that refrigerant's called. So we can go ahead and remove those compressor lines. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, disconnecting things, you know, things like this line here and this one over here. Oh, this one's already done. That makes my job easier. You know, stuff like this, part, pieces of the wiring harness, this one actually goes down to the crankshaft sensor, so you don't even need to unplug that. But like this main power feed to the car, if this is going to the car, don't worry about it, but part of it is going to the ignition, the really rudimentary ignition modules. So when you're assessing something old like this, you need to ask yourself, are you going to reuse these ancient, ancient, you know, ignition modules and uh, stuff of that nature? Or are you just going to gut it and then replace it with stuff, you know, that's tried and true and good? Uh, not to mention these vacuum lines that go to the back of the intake manifold. Uh, those vacuum lines, go ahead and just rip those off, cut them off. It doesn't matter. Replace them anyway, because they're 40 year old rubber. They're going to fail and it would be a real bummer to get this whole engine done and put back and then it misfires or doesn't run, run right because you cheaped out on one vacuum line. That would be such a bummer. So uh, it is my philosophy to just um, cut it all off and then redo the entire wiring of the car. I know that's maybe not a popular opinion because some people want to take this exact engine out and put it back exactly the way that you know Ford had it from when it rolled out of the factory and I respect that, but it's not what I'm going to be doing here today. Uh, if you wanted to go that route, that's totally fine. Just go through and methodically unplug every little connector. And I'm not going to show you that because honestly it would make this video way longer than it already is. So we're just going to go around and uh, snip off things that are holding the engine to the car. Alrighty, with all our wires that connect the engine to the rest of the car and all the vacuum lines clipped off. Again, if you were going to do this, you know, right back to factory, you would of course unplug everything properly. But honestly, these connectors, they're 40 years old and they're falling apart. I would not rely on old, brittle plastic like this. I would just replace everything. If you're building the in rebuilding the engine in a truck like this, I would just replace the whole thing and wire it myself to make sure it runs perfect. So, now we can focus on our heater core lines, which are right here. Again, you could just cut these if you wanted to, but it's probably gonna be easier just to undo the hose clamps. Just take a 10 millimeter socket, lock these hose clamps off. Now, there might be coolant in here, so maybe have a terry towel ready. You gotta remember, these have never been off before. There we go, in all likelihood for this truck, and yeah, see what I tell you. Uh, these have never been off before. And what you can do is store the heater core hose just like this in its up position so it doesn't dribble all over you. Do the same thing here for the return. Ah, there she is. And again, store it up like this so it doesn't make a big mess. There we go. Nice rusty muddy water, always good. 
So now we can focus on disconnecting our power steering pump by removing this line on the send side and we're going to need a flare nut wrench for that. So we can grab our 5 8 flare nut wrench and remove this line. Oh, it's actually turning the whole fitting, but I don't really care as long as this line comes off. There we go. So instead of the line coming out of the fitting, the fitting just came out as a whole, which is totally fine. I don't really have to worry about losing that O-ring right there or losing anything or damaging anything because we're not going to be reusing this power steering pump. We're going to get a brand new one. So like every power steering pump ever made, there is a send and return. We just removed the high pressure send line. The return line is low pressure and it's usually located on the back. Um, on this particular model, it's actually right where my index finger is. So it's kind of on the bottom, which is less than ideal. Um, and I'm just going to clip that off. This is often something people forget when they're removing an engine is the power steering return line. Might be a little tough to see, but at the end of my fingertip there is the return line. Stripping a little bit of power steering fluid. Not bad though. I'm just gonna keep this terry towel here to absorb any drips. And that is the power steering handled. All right, and the crowning jewel of our 302 is this variable Venturi dual barrel carburetor that doesn't work and are terrible and awful in every single way. If any of your vehicles or anybody you know's vehicles has one of these, I suggest replacing it because they are junk. And I'll show you exactly what to do with these once I've removed it. There's a couple things connecting this to the car. Uh, looks like there's a vacuum light here. Just disconnect easy. The uh, kick down for the transmission is already off, but it would have gone right here and had an, uh, an eddy clip or something on the end of my thumb. And you just remove that and put that away. That's really not going to get in our way. And then we have our throttle, which is right here. That can be easily pried off with a pair of needle nose. Crazy how easy that comes off, right? And then this two barrel carburetor has just four half inch nuts holding it to the intake manifold. And the reason I'm taking the carburetor off now is because I want to use the intake manifold to actually remove the engine because it's made of cast iron. It's very robust and beefy and all the things you want for removing an engine. Some people even just use where the carburetor mount in because there's four uh, studs or four bolts here. But I like to spread the load out seems to be a bit more stable and uh, I also I also like to have a load leveler so you can control the tilt angle of the engine as it comes out. So with all four fasteners removed we can now remove our carburetor any kind of vacuum line you can just pull right off and now I'm going to show you what to do with this. So take your two barrel variable venturi and throw it right into the garbage. Okay, so the next thing we can do is remove uh, this gasket slash spacer. It looks like somebody put two gaskets on. It's interesting. Okay, and this is all coming off as one piece. If you're wondering what this is, what this does is it takes coolant and runs it through a heat exchanger and it heats up the air before it goes into the combustion chamber. Um, this is also where your PCV connects into, which looks like it's not even held on. <laughs> Go ahead and remove that. That's already... That needs a snipperoonie. It's already fraying garbage. Throw that in the trash. The basic idea is that if you heat up the air with this uh, piece here, the air is easier to combust and it helps with efficiency and fuel mileage, but it does kill power. And it's kind of the opposite of what we're after here today. So we can just give this all the old sniff a lot easier. Looks like it's got a vacuum line still on there, wrestle that off. And you can unplug it if you really want to, but we're clipping things today because we are we are definitely gonna not reuse this. Come on. <laughs> so go ahead and remove these carburetor studs while I'm at it because they might get in the way of our load leveler. So two bolts are holding in the uh, retainer for the throttle cable. I'm just gonna remove those. It seems it's a lot easier than fighting with plastic clips that are just gonna break 
So this can come off the engine, which now will not inhibit us from removing the engine in the future. Now the engine isn't really attached by too much. Now what we can do is uh, take the motor mount bolts off and then our bell housing bolts and then we're ready to pluck this sucker. So over here at the intake manifold, our cast iron intake manifold, uh, we're gonna go ahead and grab our load leveler. Sometimes called the tilty thing, which is an accurate description of what it does. It tilts the engine. Now, if you were in a pinch and you didn't have one of these tilty things, but you had a chain, you could do the same thing. But in uh, two places instead of four, I prefer the four for strength reasons and Using this load leveler, it's gonna make our job a lot easier upon removal and putting it on our engine stand. Grab a half inch impact gun. Remove one of the bolts. And then I'm also gonna put on one of these, look how beefy that washer is. I love these beefy washers. You're just gonna down at Home Depot. And that's gonna prevent that bolt head from just pulling through uh, our fixture there. Tighten that up, and we can just do that three more times. So this is what our tilty thing should look like, affixed in four different places with those ultra beefy washers. So when we pull up on it, we'll be able to level the load and everything will be nice and easy when we pluck this sucker out. So what I've done is affixed my floor jack to the front of the transmission. So there's a little bit of tension on there and I'm doing that so that way when I pull the engine out, the transmission doesn't just go flop right to the ground. That can be dangerous and damage things. Uh, you really want uh, to not do that. Uh, you can even just stack wood uh, or something like that. I really like using the floor jack because you can put a little bit of tension on it, which is always good. So now at this point, you can actually remove those two last bell housing bolts that I showed earlier. Now here's a pretty exciting part. We can move our engine crane into position and hook up our tilty thing. Just like that. So what I'm gonna do now is use our load leveler to get the load as level as I can. That's pretty good. And then we can put the engine crane under some tension. And then adjust the level again. like that. And then you might want to look at clearances too. I noticed that it's binding a little bit on this cowl here. I'm just going to keep an eye on it. What you can do is just kind of pull it towards you while you're lifting up because it's only really going to hit at this one point. So this is our big moment. Uh, go ahead and double check everything again just to make sure you didn't leave any little things connected. The power steering return line uh, is a big one a lot of people forget. So go ahead and double check that. And once you're sure, you can go ahead and start pumping. Hear the trickling of water on the ground? Always a good sign. Here she comes. Oh, oh yep, here we go. Again, more water, always a good sign. Just mind how it's coming out. Make sure lots of water gets on the ground. That's key. I actually forgot uh, a little wire on the passenger side. That's why it was kind of coming out sideways. So that's why I said double check and double check everything again because uh, everyone makes mistakes. So now we know it's nice and free. We can keep pumping until it clears our front end. Alright, just keep pumping. Make sure it's not colliding with anything. Ooh. Leafy.
Okay, so this is really important. When it's, the engine is this high, its ability to tip over is really high. Do not let that happen. Just come straight back with it. Go slow, take your time. Might have to give a couple more pumps to clear the oil pan, that's okay. And then, straight back, no sudden movements. It's like dealing with a lion. Go. And while I'm not ready to put it on the engine stand just yet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it down so it's kind of around this level. That way it doesn't have such an ability to fall over. Just go very slowly with her. And she's going to want to go forward when you do that, so make sure you account for room. Just like that. And now we're ready for an engine stand. So. Here's something pretty important as well. What I've done is taken some small ratchet straps and I have affixed them to the front of the transmission and then put them in some pretty stout anchor, anchor points on each side of the vehicle, left and right. And I'm doing this that way I can remove our jack from way down there and I can move the truck around without the transmission just falling down or anything uh, crazy like that happening. You're gonna wanna do this until you can either take the transmission out, which we're not gonna do here, or when you put the engine back. So keep that in mind uh, for your upcoming project. And at this point, you can remove your jack. So one more thing I wanted to mention is you want to secure your torque converter back into your transmission somehow. I have a little bit of copper wire out of my MIG welder and it's actually on uh, pretty tight. I utilize the torque converter nuts. I should place those back on so I don't lose them. And they're helping holding the torque converter to the transmission. So the reason we're doing this is so when we're storing it, you know, who knows how long it's gonna be before we put the engine back and we might need to move this truck around and stuff. We don't want the torque converter to just fall out or worse have the torque converter come out just a little bit so it's not engaging the transmission uh, ATF pump. And if that were to happen, when well, you put the engine back and the torque converter isn't fully seated, you can actually burn up the transmission really easily doing that. So having a little bit of wire there is pretty cheap insurance. You could also use a board and a ratchet strap. Just make sure there's lots of force pushing the torque converter back into the transmission housing. So that is how to remove an engine out of an older vehicle. Maybe it's a project vehicle. Uh, you know, older American cars are very, very common. They're all over the United States and they are just begging to be plucked, have the engine rebuilt, put back, and you have a totally killer vehicle with a really reliable brand new powertrain. It is an awesome way to go and something really fun to do. One thing I wanted to mention too is that when we were pulling the engine and getting it separated from the transmission, that engine has never been separated from that transmission. So it might need a little bit of persuasion. That's why I have this really nice uh, three foot pry bar. Getting that prying implement in there and kind of jiggling it about and then prying the engine this way and prying it that way is really key. Um, you know, it really helps out, especially getting the uh, flex plate off of those torque converter studs. Um, the nice big pry bar is uh, your friend. So I've left a link down below in the description to one of those. You don't need a snap on one like I have. Uh, normal Home Depot brand will work just fine. That pretty much wraps it up. Thank you so very much for watching. I don't know uh, when we'll be putting this engine back. We want to rebuild it. I'm going to do an entire full rebuild tutorial on this Ford 302 to show you exactly how to build it. And uh, then we'll do another video on installing it back into the car and how we're going to wire it and things like that. So don't expect that anytime soon. But thank you so very much for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. And I'll catch you next time.